we're doing it. All right. Look at she that uh, nice old zoom. Yeah. Shows that I've got no money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's a good one. <clears throat> I know. Yeah, they're not all as good as that one. There's some some of them were, uh, you know, I say this as a podcaster, and I've used all kinds of zooms, and I teach podcasting too. And this is this one's a good one. Yeah, you know what's best on Zooms? They're very affordable, and the, but the built-in mics are really good. And that's what separates Zoom from the other. See, the, the body of it is made out of crap plastic, and if you dropped it, it burst into a million pieces. But the mics, that's where all the money went. Yeah, I know. That's why, that's why, <laughs> that's why I got... That's what I got one for. <laughs> anyway, we're sat here in the garden, <laughs> yes, because... Because why sit in an air-conditioned gloomy room when at least even though you're sweating buckets that uh, you can get something um, you can feel a bit better. It's only going to be 35 degrees today, right? What's 35? Gonna, I think it's going to be a bit warmer than that. Tomorrow 37 degrees. Oh, I'm just going to go away and, and melt. Anyway, this week on the podcast, um, I'm joined by uh, Jonathan Gruber, who has arrived about two weeks ago, I think he'll tell us. Um, in the north of the country and then has gone off uh, around the region uh, and as normal I uh, have difficulty in doing research I think it must be the worst part of my ill-disciplined self so Jonathan without being boring sure first welcome and thank who you who is actually Jonathan Gruber so Jonathan Gruber is a 54 year old native of Brooklyn New York uh, raised in a nice working class family in New York City, but I, I made my way over to Europe after college because I uh, met a Dutch woman and then she and I uh, moved in together. We broke up really fast and then I stayed in the Netherlands for a few more years and just as I was about to leave the country, I came across a woman who was a Bosnian refugee. So we're talking about 1994 already. This is quite a while ago, my friends. And uh, I fell in love with her. And then we got married, we had children. So there was a neutral it was a neutral place, the Netherlands, so we stayed there, and I've, I still live in the Netherlands to this day. Having said that, I have been coming back and forth to this part of Bosnia, the Banja Luka area, right? You called it what? Northeast? North, northwest, I northwest, think. Northwest, excuse yeah. me, northwest yeah. uh, Bosnia. And I've been coming here since 1997, when there were still tanks rolling in the streets for the peace force that was holding this country together because it was you could I mean evidence of the war at that time was still incredibly evident it was everywhere a lot of the the roads outside of the cities where the fighting was they were basically some tarmac with giant holes in them you know being held together by holes is the expression and all these shot up villages place doesn't look like this now bosnia is all nicely cleaned up and uh it, it's become a pretty wonderful peaceful a uh, beautiful place filled with incredibly kind people and I come here gladly uh, all the time and I'm back for the first time after uh, the pandemic. a big COVID break right so this is my first time back in two years and it's better than ever folks I love it here I found you by chance when doing I, I mentioned earlier my poor research skills but I was researching uh, I can't remember exactly what it was to do with Bosnia Herzegovina, and I came across this podcast, uh, which I've subsequently found out won some awards, and it was about this guy, Jonathan Gruber, um, and a lady uh, who had been <laughs> born uh, in Banja Luka. It was an almost, how would I say, warts and all uh, a story, and that captivated me, and I said, I've, I've really got to meet this guy, so you can imagine um, my excitement at the moment, having a chance to, to, to talk to you. How the heck did you come to get into a situation where uh -huh. you talked about this, this love story, really, about a guy from Brooklyn that meets a girl from Banja Luka? How did that, that, that podcast, that, that whole thing come about? Right, so this is actually... Uh, I know that my son was two, I think, when they made that. He's 19 now. So that means that that's 17 years old, that uh, documentary. It was a documentary. And um, when I moved to the Netherlands, one of the first things I did was find myself some work at an organization called Radio Netherlands, which at the time was the external broadcaster of the Netherlands, the equivalent to BBC World Service or Deutsche Welle or Voice of America, that kind of thing. So it was, for the most part, it was a shortwave broadcaster that was quickly in the process of becoming more and more irrelevant uh, after the end of the Cold War. But I, I started working there and I began my journalistic 
uh, uh, radio career there, uh, first doing news reading and then doing actual reporting and then doing program making and then doing documentaries. So, now to the relevant part. One we had there a documentary maker named Dira Sujan, and Dira Sujan met me and my wife, and we were uh, funny and difficult people. I think that's hasn't funny and funny and that difficult. Is, that has not changed. <laughs> we are both funny and we are both difficult still, and we have. I think our relationship could best be described as loving and stormy. And that too has not changed. But back then, we were both beginning to realize what we'd gotten ourselves into with these very volatile personalities, right? So, sorry, I'm just going to put my water down. So we, uh, uh, Dira got this idea to just sort of, as this strange international couple with a kid, in the meantime, we have two kids, uh, to interview us about what it was like to be in that relationship. And it turned out to be, what could I say, stormy, but also uh, entertaining. <laughs> I think funny. I think the world gets, I think there's a certain amount of schadenfreude on the part of the listener, listening to, you know, how we describe each other and the relationship and, uh, you know, there's singing and there's laughing and there's cursing and there's crying. And uh, I think my life continues to be this way. It hasn't changed. Yeah, I was mentioning to you um, a little earlier about my daughter living in um, Brooklyn, the area of New York, Brooklyn, and you said where where was she living? And I said Park Slope, and you said oh the posh part. And I've been thinking, what was it like for you in Brooklyn when you grew up? Is it the Brooklyn of today? So Brooklyn's huge. It has two and a half million people. So it's the largest and most populous borough. It's not physically the largest, but it's by far the most populous borough. And so your experience of New York City and your experience of Brooklyn, some of it is a shared experience, but a, a, like how you grew up is largely determined by the area you grew up in. And if people who are from any large city understand that the neighborhood is more determinative. So that's the way it was for me. So I grew up in a neighborhood called Sheepshead Bay. It was very white working class. Uh, everybody who was there at that time, it's now completely changed, the ethnic makeup is completely changed. It's the second place you end up. The first place is the people who are literally right off the boat, because it's, it's all people who are the children of immigrants, as is ever the American story. And uh, the first place you end up is in a ghetto, and the second place you end up is in a place like Sheepshead Bay, which is slightly better than the ghetto, but not really great yet. Still pretty conservative. There's a whole sort of a as the smell of the old world is still on it in many ways. It's also really ugly. Everything was built in the post-war period, but it had the advantage of, it had a couple of advantages. The subway, which could take you anywhere out of Sheepshead Bay. And believe me, it was like coming from a small town, a place you wanted to leave. Uh, but it was also really close to the sea. It was close to Coney Island, which you may have heard of, and Brighton Beach, and so, its proximity to places much more interesting was, was okay. But Sheepshead Bay itself, you know, it was a, a, I would say it was largely made up of uh, Ashkenazi Jews, so Jews from Northern Europe, and uh, Italians, which, and some Irish, which through some strange quirk, some strange ethnic alchemy, turns out to be an ethnic mix which really works. So there was, if there was ever conflict in that area, it was never ethnic. Nobody was calling each other ethnic names. You know what I mean? It was just take, like for everybody, it was like taken for granted that you were either Jewish or you were Italian or you were Irish, and it was all good. It was all good for some reason. Yeah, I ne we, there were always fights, there was always problems because it was a working class neighborhood, but it was never about your ethnicity. Isn't that interesting? I was about to say, London, we have the same sort of thing, yeah. but yeah, I don't know, when I, when I was young, yeah, I, I can't remember the ethnic name calling, but I do remember that we would call each other's names whether we, whether we came from North, South, East or West London, so right, yeah. we were ethnically like joined up in each of those, those areas. <laughs> you sent me a message saying, do you fancy coming to the American Corner in Banja Luka? Uh, I couldn't come to see you, but you... And what is that? You, what is the American Corner in Bandalooka? I believe it's an American community centre. I don't know, but it's an information uh, yeah, point. Yeah. Um, and you were talking about um, narrative journalism. Yeah. Um, 
what was it like for you to talk to uh, people from the city and people from the region about narrative journalism? For example, did they even know what narrative journalism was? I think they got the idea, but they'd never really experienced it. Um, and narrative journalism, for people who are wondering what that is, a standard form of journalism is the five W's and an H journalism, where you have the inverted pyramid and you get all the information in, in the first two paragraphs of a story or right at the beginning of a, of a uh, television news story or radio news story, right? You get it all in. In a narrative news story, you don't do it that way. In a narrative news story, it's you, you're literally telling it in, in story form. Right? So you create a central question and you, this, basically the story gets more interesting as you go along rather than less interesting, like in a standard news story. And you build it all the way to a climax. And so the idea is that you want to uh, give people the news, but you want to do it in story form so that they become more emotionally involved because human beings have evolved to uh, uh, attach uh, emotion to information and if you do that you retain it much better and, and this is very important you care more about it um, whereas most of the time if you have a new story you don't really care all that much um, you get the information but you don't retain much and you sort of move on to the next thing and whereas if you tell somebody something in story format they they understand why something matters to them the, the stories become humanized they can relate it to their own lives and, and then they care so that's the main difference between uh, five W's and an H journalism and narrative journalism. And so I prefer to do narrative journalism. It's, it's more satisfying as a journalist as well to do it that way. What was the response to, to what you were talking about? Was it, oh, here he comes talking about something new or is it something that you think might be embraced? Because when you, especially with television here, when you watch uh, television from almost anywhere in the region, it's, de it's definitely the W's and the H. I, well, first of all, people, professionals from that industry did not come to the American corner that day. Probably because they don't speak English. That's probably the biggest issue. Uh, and also because it was very impromptu. We set it up, I did it on a Wednesday. We'd actually, I met the person at the American corner quite coincidentally uh, at a barbecue where we were doing Ispot Sacha. And uh, it was the son of a friend. Uh, your doctor and uh, he oh Berko yeah Berko's son uh -huh. runs the American corner oh wow yeah so he uh, 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 said why don't you come and talk there so it was literally Sunday we agreed to do it Monday it was advertised and then we did it on Wednesday so there wasn't a lot of time for a huge crowd to come so we had a good I don't know it seemed like 10 people were there in the end and it was they all the people who came saw the usefulness of this seemed to have a really good time and see it left i think kind of inspired by uh the concepts that were in it and also the way that i've teached i've been teaching it for a long time so i've kind of gotten good at it now and so they seemed kind of inspired by the whole thing and that's great but is it gonna have a, is it gonna have an effect on how journalism here works no not yet maybe i think things are changing a lot like like i said the internet is uh has changed kind of everything. The whole paradigm of how everything works uh, and how people are influenced, here it was all used to be very insular and a very closed world. But there's this whole new generation of people growing up in Bosnia, regardless of their backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, they're all having a, the shared experience of being young and being exposed to how social media works now. And they're going to be so different from their parents. So how it'll all work in the future, I don't know, but I know it won't be the same. I know it's gonna be very, very different. Yeah. I'm wondering about, yeah, how people will tell stories about the country and the region as it is today. There's very few of us online telling stories, I think, in a meaningful way. Um, and I'm finding it very difficult to find a key that will unlock the potential of people from here to, to start to talk about where they come from. You know, when, as I go, go on to say about people that we, we host here, um, and they meet local people, the, almost without fail, it's, why did you come here? And if that is the underlying... <laughs> If that is the underlying thought going through people from here, 
to get good stories coming out of this country being told by the people from this country it looks like a bit of a Mount Iger situation but with very little in the way of climbing gear yeah I mean there's this is a mixed blessing though isn't it because on the one hand the fact that it's a bit of an undiscovered part of Europe means that it's not being overrun which every other part of nice part of Europe has been overrun uh, I think they'll get here eventually I think the, probably there's a number of big issues. The issue number one is the fact that all of Bosnia is not in the EU. It's, there, it's not even in the running to, to get into the EU. There's no discussion about it. And there's poor road infrastructure. So getting to this part, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all a bit unknown. It's all a bit difficult. I mean, how long are the lines at the borders? Imagine you booked a vacation here. How long are you going to, and you want to come during the summer. How long are you going to be in line at the border? just to get into the country. What a pain in the butt. The upside is now is that over in this little old airport we have here at Banja Luka, there are now a few uh, of the low cost carriers that are regularly bringing people here. And that's a much easier way of getting in than, than by driving. But traditionally in Europe, people pack up the car with the kids, you know, and they come on over. Even though this part of the world has lots of things to do and there's a whitewater rafting and it's very beautiful and, you know, the countryside is, you know, how many unspoiled countrysides do you have left in Europe? Well, Bosnia's got that, right? It's a, it's a rarity in this continent. Uh, but, you know, how do you sell it? How do you sell the former war zone with long lines at the borders and poor infrastructure and the, the, the continuing instability? It's a tough sell. You got to get people to invest in it and they won't as long as this place as long as the way Bosnia is run is all up in the air and you never know what's going to happen the next day or if it's all going to kick off again one day even though it doesn't really seem like that's the case to me. I don't think anybody feels like picking up their guns anytime soon. But it's unstable and weird. And if you're a business, would you invest in this part of the world when you really don't know what's going to happen? I'd think about it, you know? I wouldn't be sure. And that's a tragedy, of course, because this place is kind of great. Yeah. Listen, we've been chatting for quite some time. What is next for Jonathan Gruber? I know you're going to say I'm, my wife is going to come and pick me up and then I'm going to go back to the, <laughs> and I'm going to go back to the pool and everything else like that. But what is what is what is next in your world? In my world, I'm uh, my vacation's coming to an end. I've got to go back to work soon and I'll be teaching uh, for the Radio Netherlands Training Center. And uh, I'll be teaching investigators. We should get you to come back and teach here. We should find we somebody. Should. We should find somebody that will fund a course with one of the leading podcasters. That'd be interesting, wouldn't that it? That would be interesting. And in fact, the the organization that I teach for, most of the students who uh, are in the course, like like ninety five percent of them get a grant from the Dutch government to be in the course because they're from people who are mid-career journalists from developing countries. Bosnia and Herzegovina is not on that list. They don't do Europe, I think. As far as I can tell, there are no grants available. And really, they should be, don't you think? Well, this, I do. This country I, I do. really should be, they should be a grant. This is a developing country. It's a second world country. And it could use that kind of professional media training. Why not? So that's what I'm going to be doing. And then I'm going to be make, working on more podcasts. Uh, and uh, I have a few things lined up. And then I'll be teaching uh, radio journalism at the University of Groningen in the north of the Netherlands at the end of the year. And that's what's happening in Gruber world. In Gruber world, when he's teaching at the University of Groningen, does he speak Dutch or does he speak English? It's, it's, uh, it's the, I can actually speak Dutch, but it's the international... Uh, it's the, they have an, like an international masters, so I do it in English, because everybody there is from, most of the people in my classes, not all, but most are not from the Netherlands, so. And if people want to get hold of you, how can they do it? So, you can go to grubermedia.com, G-R-E-W, mm, how do I say it? G-R-E, <laughs> it's G-R-E-W-B-E-A-R, like Gru Bear. I, it's I a laugh. homonym, I don't even know. I um, honestly, I don't pay a lot of attention to my own website. I really and you're need, in the media. I need to update it. <laughs> I really need to update my website. It's true. Uh, uh, so, G-R-E-W-B-E-A-R media.com. 
So that's not how I spell my last name, but that's how it sounds. Because it's Gru Bear. Rhymes with Pooh Bear. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan, thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure. Today. Pleasure, pleasure. It's great. Thank you, man. Happy with that? Yeah. <laughs>